glad you are all here in this circle for our story time. I want you to look around at that chair. We have a sign on it that says reserved for Bland. And our friend Bland used to sit in that chair week after week. After all these years, he would sit in that chair right there. But week before last, he died. And before he died, we read to him some beautiful psalms in the Bible. And we spoke to him of our, our love and God's love for him. And we remembered his love for this community. He loved this church. And he didn't want to leave us, but his body got very sick. And he couldn't get well. And so he, he died. And just before he died, we said some beautiful poetic words to him that said, is there anything that can separate us from the love of God? And this verse in Romans says, no, there's nothing. So let's think about that. Is there anything that can separate us from the love of God? Can running away separate us? No. The love of God is still running with us. Can walls separate us from the love of God? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> no. There's the love of God, even with the walls we try to build up. Can sickness, <laughs> can that separate us from the love of God? No. Even in our sickness, there is a love of God that shelters us and embraces us. Can storms <laughs> separate us from the love of God? No. The love of God is there even in the storm. Can hiding separate us from the love of God? No. <laughs> Even in our hiding, there is God. And even <clears throat> in death, can death separate us from the love of God? No, not even death can separate us from the love of God. Oh, thanks be to God for this kind of love with us through everything. I'm set at being in the circle for a prayer. I need your help. <laughs> Thank you, O oh God, for your love that is with us in life and death and in all the many ways in which we live our lives. We thank you for your love that knows no end. Amen. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks God. God. Sometimes the Christ is hidden from us in the daily round. And sometimes the Christ is present in profound ways. And we can know the presence through the presence of others. 
and an unutterable sense of the mystery that we call holy. Some of us experienced such a time when we were present in the dying and death of Bland. The thin veil of mere appearances was lifted, and we witnessed the awe and wonder of death's embrace. It was Tuesday, June 11th, that our longtime church member and friend, Bland Minton, died. He had a lung disease that kept him in the hospital for weeks. And some of you were able to visit him during those weeks and bringing not only your presents, but milkshakes, <laughs> which was his favorite thing. And through the uncanny and surprising work of the Spirit, there happened to be four of us from this congregation present for Bland's last two hours of his life on earth. We were with Bland's son, Keith, who had arrived that day from his home in Chapel Hill. Mahan, Missy, Mark, Keith and I encircled Bland's bed as he labored to new life into the mystery of life beyond death. We were in that circle on behalf of this circle. The four of us wanted to share with you our keen awareness that we were present on behalf of the love and mercy of this community. Soaked in our years of accompanying people through joys and sorrows, <clears throat> through prayers and presence, you were there. An unseen but strongly felt presence of faith and love. So this service is not a full memorial service for Bland. That will happen later with his family. But we do give Bland tribute today as we name again our calling as Christ's community, bearing witness to the mystery and the holy hope of a life unending in love. For we are convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. There's no one single way that death happens or unfolds. It's as deeply individual as each of our lives. As a chaplain part-time at Mission, I spend quite a bit of time with people who are dying. In fact, about 75% of the patients that I see are dying. Most of the time, they're, they're surrounded by friends and family in those moments, often both. Sometimes they are surrounded by stories and laughter and tears, be, bearing witness to a presence and reality that is larger and stronger than any illness or pain or death. But sadly, sometimes people are also completely alone. Sometimes there is deep agony and resistance to the final moments of letting go and releasing one's spirit. Sometimes death arrives at the end of a long and good life. And other times, death comes much too soon for us to understand, comprehend, or accept. But no matter how a person transitions from this earthly world into the next place, into the eternal embrace of God's love, it is a holy and sacred moment to be present to you. As Nancy said, the four of us who were present with Bland will be sharing a little bit about that tonight. And as she shared, it wasn't just us in that room with Bland a week and a half ago. We were there on behalf of this entire community. And each of you were there with us, not only in that moment, but in the many moments that you were present with Bland and Carol over the years. 
Bland listened to a voice beyond himself. He made a decision. He listened to something beyond this world and leaned into the invitation to let go, to release, to enter fully into the presence of the great arms of love and light that were so delighted and rejoiced in receiving him. A friend of mine uh, sent a poem to me this past week, and the name of the poem is entitled, Monet Refuses the Operation, by Liesl Mueller. And I believe the words that Mueller pens encompass some of the best hope that we can have for what it means, for what it might feel and look like to step into what I am convinced that the dying in their final moments glimpse, understand, and experience more deeply than we who remain here on earth. And here are her words. Doctor, you say that there are no halos around streetlights in Paris, and what I see is an aberration. I tell you it has taken me all my life to arrive at the vision of gas lamps as angels, to soften and blur and finally banish the edges you regret I don't see, to learn that the line that I called the horizon does not exist, and sky and water so long apart are the same state of being. Fifty-four years before I could see, Ruin Cathedral is built of parallel shafts of sun. And now you want to restore my youthful errors, fixed notions of top and bottom, the illusion of three-dimensional space, mysterious separate from the bridge that it covers. What can I say to convince you the Houses of Parliament dissolve night after night to become the fluid dream of the Thames. <coughs> I will not return to a universe of objects that don't know each other as if islands were not the lost children of one great continent. The world is flux, and light becomes what it touches, becomes water, lilies on water, above and below water, becomes lilac and mauve, and yellow and white, and cerulean lamps, small fists passing sunlight so quickly to one another that it would take long streaming hair inside my brush to catch it. To paint the speed of light, our weighted shapes, these verticals, burn to mix with air and change our bone, skin, clothes to gases. Doctor, if you could only see how heaven pulls earth into its arms, and how infinitely the heart expands to claim this world, blue vapor without end. This poem is a creative speculation about the Impressionist artist Monet's initial refusal to have cataracts removed from his eyes, because he wanted to paint the light, not the object that you can see. He saw this as an opportunity for a new kind of vision, to see the world in a different light, to choose and have agency, acknowledging that the world is not made up of separate things. The expectation that we will be able to count on kindness during our time of need becomes one of life's most sustaining convictions. We hope that if we become incapacitated, our friends and relatives will stand by us, we suspect that the measure of a good life is how we are treated in the end. The author Gary Gunderson expands on this notion saying, I suspect that the measure of a community is how we and those we love expect to be treated during those times of incapacity that we will surely experience. And all that you hear shared tonight, may you be reminded that you are a part of a community that will do its best to continue showing up, being present, and bearing witness to that which we hold to be true. We won't always get it exactly right, but we believe that absolutely nothing, not even death, can separate us from the deep and abiding love of God in Christ Jesus.
comes to Blaine and Carol, uh, I need to write. I'm going to be brief. I need to write. I apologize. I'll take to read it. My few comments are not just about Blaine. They are witness to God. Or if you prefer, to grace. Or if you prefer, to wondrous mystery. In the tradition of testimonies, I offered this testimony of the four of us representing the circle <coughs> at Bland's dying 12, uh, about 12 days ago. Lewis and I visited Bland that Monday, uh, before that Tuesday of his death. We could tell he was coming toward the end. He was struggling then mightily to breathe. I have known Bland and Carol for over 30 years. Uh, they were members of the congregation. I served as pastor before they came here. In these years, Bland has struggled. A restless climber of the next mountain peak. He struggled to get not one, but three graduate degrees in theology, law, and social work. He struggled to achieve professionally in two fields. He struggled magnificently, as we witnessed, to care for Carol for 11 years. He has struggled since her death with his health, his job at Walmart, his finances, seeking desperately to find some secure ground to stand on and to have a life. On Tuesday a week ago, as been said, Keith, his son, Nancy, Missy, Mark, and I gathered to watch him struggle. For each breath, even with the help of maximum assistance from the machine, more struggle. Struggle to stay alive. Then God, our gracious mystery, our surprise and joy, call it what you will, happened. Perhaps it was the naming of Carol that triggered the abrupt change. But something ignited Bland's last act of independence. He, with great effort, tore off his mask, his last struggle. His breathing, no more labored, became calm and calmer and relaxing as if falling into love. No more struggle. He seemed to be surrendering to the sounds of loving prayers of blessing and thanksgiving and permissions to let go from our side. And who knows what was happening from the other side. In that 10 or 15 minutes, land yields to the peace enveloping him. His breathing softer and softer until not at all. When you witness a God thing, when you know sacred breakthroughs, when you experience gracious mystery, you have to name it to be. You have to name it in community. To complete such sacred moments, you have to name it in worship and give thanks. We give thanks. Some lessons before dying. It was 4:10 on Tuesday, the 11th of June, 
fourth floor of St. Joe's Asheville Specialty Hospital, an acute care facility for people with complex diagnoses. I knew something was up when I saw Bland and Mayhem talking together alone in his room. What was strange to someone like me who had been there for two hours already was that Bland's breathing mask was off and he had removed it. And it took a great deal of effort for him to take it off. And that meant only one thing, that no one was saying. The doctors and medical staff are not in charge now. This new turn at 410 was a surprise start to a conclusion of my previous two hours at Bland's bedside. Most of the time he had been asleep, unconscious, being oxygenated by a breathing mask that had to be tightly fitted against his face so it could force the 100% oxygen gas into his lungs. His mask was thick and it was tight. No way he could talk easily through it. And his oxygen delivery device was loud. Twice Plan woke up and he could only nod as I talked. And I began simply by saying, I know. And we grasped hands in brotherhood. His eyes told me that he knew, and I understood, that his next life was near. He knew that he was not coming back to his body he had six weeks ago. So when I saw Mayhem with Bland at 410, maskless, I said, this is big. Could it possibly be? Without the oxygen being forced into his lungs, it took no thinking to know that he would soon die. So I called out to Missy and Nancy and Bland's son Keith, who are in a little waiting room outside Bland's room. Hey, Bland's mask is off. And we all rushed in. Eight of us were in the room with Bland as he chose his destiny. Bland, two nurses, Keith, Mayhem, Missy, Nancy, and me. The nurses were at the ready for intervening, but they let things play out. Bland's monitor went into an alarm mode as it registered his physical decline. Heart rate dropped from the 90s to the 40s. Breathing rate from 20 to less than 5. Oxygen rate, 90s to the 60s. After so many alarms, one nurse just turned that thing off. And all this time, Keith was holding his dad's hand and speaking repeatedly into his left ear, Dad, it's okay. We'll be okay. Go to Carol. When Bland's breaths became very slow, someone suggested that we pray him out. And holding hands, we chained up with Bland's hands and began our prayers. I guess it was five, maybe ten minutes of prayers. Last in the prayer chain, I did a variation of Dag Hammarskjöld's famous meditation. Night is drawing nigh for all that has been thanks and for all that shall be yes. And somewhere in that prayer, around 445, I think Bran, Bland drew his last. It was, as we have mentioned tonight, a holy, sacred, thin time as we imagined him whole and hale and healed and holding Carol. Three lessons. Bland has been intentional about not being clingy to life. He had met his major goal of outliving his care time for Carol. He had told us several times that when it was time to go, he was letting go. Imagine the kind of life he had to live to decide when it was time to die. So I want to remember Bland's intentionality and the grace of recognizing and then choosing as part of his life when to die. Two, when you die or do anything big, be surrounded by people who love you. Three, who you are and who you become are chiefly determined by those who love you. Bland retaught me that we do not belong to ourselves, 
Because when you belong to others in love, well, what exactly can death do to you? We don't need bucket lists to help us know when it's time to go. We just need each other. So thank you, Glenn, for these lessons before dying. Okay. 
Those were the actual last words I heard him speak. Okay. Friends, there is so much we don't know, can't know, don't know how to explain. And Jesus? I'm not even sure that he could explain it clearly enough. But this much was clear to him. In the face of his own death, he wanted to be surrounded and encircled by his friends. And so he got really clear, gathered them around. And this is what he gave. And what he wanted was for them to remember and be real clear about the grace extended to them. So he said, here, here it is. This bread we give thanks for. And we give thanks for all the times that we have gathered and broken it and shared it together. And so now, be clear about this. This is a body. A body broken open for you. Take and eat. Eat this grace. Here it is, the cup. It is this that we give thanks for, for all the times it has been poured for each other, for all the times we have poured it together, and all the times we have shared this cup. We give thanks. And we remember our connection that we can't even begin to name. Be clear about this. This cup is pouring out forgiveness for you. Pour it into each other and pour it into this unforgiving world. Drink this grace. Friends, table has been set for you. Christ's table. For you, for us, for all.